The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. Heinemann is a provider of resources written by real teachers for real classrooms. Heinemann values teachers as decision makers and students as curious learners. Discover the path to lifelong professional learning at Heinemann.com. Heinemann is dedicated to teachers. I'm Steph from Heinemann, and today on the podcast, we're excited to bring you the third conversation in our Turn and Talk series, hosted by author Ellen Keane. If you missed the previous episode, you can go back on our feed and listen to it now. Turn and Talk is a celebration of Heinemann's 40th anniversary, hosting conversations between authors who have written for Heinemann since its early years, and those who are newer authors, bringing their unique perspectives to the table. This series tackles issues facing educators today, like how much autonomy do individual teachers really have? Can we ensure equity for all students? And what's it like to launch your ideas through books and podcasts into the world of education? Patterned after the New York Times' Table for Three column, host Ellen Keane poses questions to authors and engages them in a reflective conversation. In this third Turn and Talk discussion, Ellen is joined by Linda Reef, most recently the author of The Quick Rate Handbook, and Sara Ahmed, author of Being the Change, Lessons and Strategies to Teach Social Comprehension, as they share their stories of their teaching journeys, teacher autonomy, and student inquiry. Linda is an eighth grade teacher at Oyster River Middle School in Durham, New Hampshire. That's right. And yeah. <laughs> Sara Ahmed is currently serving as a literacy coach in the elementary school at NIST International School in Bangkok. Bangkok. Thailand. I feel really privileged to do this for, for Heinemann's 40th birthday and really eager to hear what you two have to say about some of these ideas this morning. So the first one that has been sort of on my mind really revolves around the idea of teacher agency. So here we are at NCTE and the theme of the conference is elevating student voice. We talk a lot about student agency and, and empowerment and raising student voice, and I think it's precisely the, the right conversation to be having at this point in the trajectory of education and our learning. And I also wonder, when, when do we talk about our colleagues' agency, about teacher agency, and about how uh, potent teachers feel in their positions right now or not? I worry and I wonder about people who are, for whom the curriculum is being written for them. They feel like they're confined to scripts or pacing guides. I worry a little bit about the sense of efficacy that young teachers feel, particularly coming into the field. And that, you know, when literally when jobs are on the line and they're, they're feeling like if I don't comply, that literally their jobs are on the line. And yet, they understand even from very early career positions that to comply is not necessarily to do the right thing on behalf of students. And that that rub, that edge, that conflict really is what I'd love to hear you talk about first. It feels to me it's a time of compliance and of other people writing writing curriculum. I wonder if it isn't time for a little disruption in pedagogy and in in, in the ways that we approach things and the ways, the questions that we ask, the uh, sort of, I don't want to say passivity, but the um, willingness that we have to just do that thing that we are told to do, even when we feel it may not be in, in kids' mm -hmm. best interests. It really brings me to this idea that I've cherished, we all, I think Americans cherish, which is civil disobedience. Is it time in American schooling to foster, provoke a little civil disobedience with respect to teachers getting to make the decisions that they are best equipped to make? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm going to jump in. I worry about that because I see so many young teachers that they're afraid to not comply with things that have been given to them. Mm -hmm. And we've now moved tenure up to five years instead of three years. So there's even a longer time period where they're really nervous. They want to be doing what's best for kids. And we talk a good game of, uh, I think, so often in administrative circles that we're always doing what's best for kids. But I don't think it's what's best for kids if you're not with those kids day after day after yeah. day. So I, I worry that we bring young teachers in 
who we're trying to hire the best teachers we can find, and yet then we don't trust them enough by handing them somebody else's guide and tell them they must comply. Who can't know the children. Right. Someone yeah. who's written this who can't, right, by definition, yeah. know the kids. Right. Right? Yeah. It's often the people that making decisions in education, right, are not in the classroom yeah. with the kids. It's yeah. historical. But I think we mask um, compliance with the word fidelity. Like we uh, sometimes say, you know, I'm teaching this with fidelity. Yeah. I'm using this boxed curriculum with fidelity. I'm doing all these things. And so then people take on that word. You know, there's always some buzz term. And then administrators use that. I've heard it. We're using this with fidelity. Are you using this program with fidelity with your kids? And like that really means to me when I hear it in the tone that it's used is it's compliance. Yep. Well, and say more about what you mean by that. By fidelity, are you following it? Yeah, like following it to the T. Like, um, you know, there's curriculums out there that are scripted and day one is this, right? And the scope and the sequence and the progression looks like this. And I've been in schools where everyone is on the same page, the same day, in the same grade with five different classrooms with 32 different kids in all of those yep. rooms. So how could And you pacing guides. This pacing is another, guides. you know, yeah. Well, yeah. Where is there? And, so, and where do you know the kids? So that that's sort of what I, I'm thinking, but the teachers use that term with me. Oh, they really use this with fidelity. They've been doing it for five years. We really, I keep hearing it over and over again. I, yeah, I do as well. Yeah. You know, th that's the other part that bothers me or worries me sometimes with teachers, that because you don't trust yourself, if I follow this script and it doesn't work, then it's not my fault. Right. Somebody else right. gave this to me. So I, I worry there's a little bit of that. I'm not confident enough to design or figure out what I should be doing with the kids. So I'll do this and then I don't have to worry about it because it was not my fault. Right. Somebody made me do it. So I, me I, I mean, it. that worries me too. And in that, in that scenario, Linda, how does a colleague build a sense of agency and confidence when, you know, when you're in that cycle where you feel you must or you're, you're compliant in doing so? How do we help teachers sort of get over that ridge of fidelity and compliance. Well, and I think that's where we as teachers have to begin to talk to each other. And I, I mean, I know as, as language arts colleagues in our building, when we meet, which is only once a month, sometimes twice a month, which isn't mm -hmm. enough at all, but at least in those meetings, we're talking about how'd you get the kids to do that? How'd you get the kids to move that writing? How did you go about assessing or evaluating that? What are the books that you're using with the kids that we can build on? So those conversations, I think, are incredibly essential. But I also think administrators, somebody else buying materials for the classroom teacher doesn't trust the teacher. So who did you hire? Did you hire the best or are you hiring people because you want them to be compliant? Yes. Well, and if, if the administrator or whomever purchases the program doesn't trust the teacher, then I worry acutely that that, that passes down to a lack of trust for the kids. Right? One of the things upon Definitely. which your work has always been based, mine as well, I hope, is the idea that we trust kids to make decisions around topic choice, around books that they want to read, and really about how they want to show their thinking and how they want to participate in the community of the classroom right. and the community outside of the school. Right. Those are choices that we feel comfortable giving kids. But if someone isn't trusting us, then right. does that lack of trust get uh, pushed out into the classroom? Well, I wonder, too, if it's in, you know, if you just sit back and kind of listen to the way meetings run, team meetings, school meetings, professional development meetings. Like, Linda, the, the thing you just did was that you asked questions. How did you get the kids there? You hear a lot of questions, which will grow a conversation. So if you right. listen into schools and how their faculty collaborates or has meetings. I wonder if you listen for, are there more questions at the table, right? How could we get them there if we're looking at a central right. idea or a essential question for the unit and people are saying, oh, how can we get the kids there? What would we like their learning experiences to be? Then there's trust in the room. Yeah. Then there's some agency right. that's going to happen. Right. That will trickle down. And you're the putting the, the materials in the script aside for a minute yeah. to start with that question. Yeah, and push into that yeah. as a team yeah. rather than saying we're going to be on page 43 tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Page 44. On I, I don't, I, that boggles my mind. I don't know how 
any other teacher, even in my building, could be on the same page that I'm on. It, things happen from day one, from the first five minutes. <laughs> you, you have this plan, but it goes awry. Because I mean, just yeah, reading your book, Sarah, yeah. th- there are so many times where the kids come in with questions that if you don't address them yeah. or you don't make it pertinent and relevant to what the kids are doing, you're not going to move them forward because 100%. their lives depend on us saying, we heard you, right. we so we're going to you. build, we see you, yeah. and we're going to build on what we learn from you and what questions you have. It doesn't have to be this curriculum with somebody from the outside doesn't know those children right. at all. Right. Wow. It's staggering. The question then is what to do, right? Yeah. And I think you, I think this is, you know, this is a good start. We're sort of talking about questions and questions that start in a team level or a faculty level, and then questions that, that look at the sort of big ideas of a unit of study ahead of time without necessarily having all of the steps in front of you. And it's, it's what I hear you saying, Sarah, is that it's generative, Mm -hmm. that teachers talking together are generating, creating, you know, and inventing really the kinds of experiences that they need, they, they know their kids need. Yeah, because they know their kids. Yeah, because if you're going to ideate with your team members and your colleagues, that's I hope going yeah. to also be what's being mirrored in the classroom. But teachers often it's hard because everyone uses time. This is a global right. issue. Right. Time, You've right? Now the schedule, right. yeah, yeah. It's, it's no every, different in Bangkok. It's everywhere, yeah. And so, um, oftentimes, you know, you sit down and to collaborate, which there are. Some schools have really great collaboration times with their teams, and some just don't have it at all. I also think there are decisions that we make individually when the classroom door closes. And I'm thinking about that a lot lately because the the number of decisions that we make in a day is staggeringly high. And if we Mm -hmm. are dependent on a preconceived curriculum, how do we, when the door closes, metaphorically, I hope, break out of that? How can we make individual, daily, little decisions of disruption? Yeah. Little decisions that say, you know what? Nope, I'm not going to yeah. do it that way. And from that, from those, from the moment that we make one of those sort of courageous decisions to say, that's not me, that's not my kids. Yeah even a little decision, you know, then I think we we start to build the confidence, Linda, that you're talking about, and that can... Well, I think even even with scripted programs, I, I mean, I think back when I first started teaching, there was an anthology of literature that we were handed, and I thought, oh, you mean we're supposed to go from chapter to chapter and piece to piece questions at the end, and immediately knew that wasn't right. That doesn't make sense to me because you don't know. I mean, you could bring anybody in if you've got the questions at the end. Here's the list of kids in the classroom. You don't know anything about them. Now, I think the way that we start to change that, that closed door metaphorically, is you might use bits and pieces of it, but that doesn't become your entire day. No. And you have to start saying, I'm sorry, that's not where we had to go today. Yeah. And you have to start to have the courage to say those things. Yeah, you do. Because teachers are researchers in so many ways, right? You're researching your kids, you're researching your classroom. If I'm reading both of your books, I'm researching the pieces that will work for my kids and implementing those. Ellen, even your line where you just said, like, I'm going to, you know, close my door and like, I'm not going to do it this way. Even just shifting to say we, because that's, we're not going to do it this way. Right. Us in right. this classroom yes. as our Class. kids, right? right? Exactly. Because then right. it's also yeah. then, you know, yeah. in trouble. Because, um, right. you know, yeah. you're saying like, we as a community yeah. in this classroom yeah. are not going to do it this we're, way. We're going to make this decision and I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to take that step, maybe small at first. Yeah. But then it empowers me with questions to ask of decision makers. But but that empowerment also comes from, I I mean, I'm thinking here we are at NCTE and that empowerment comes, you have to have a professional community that supports you, lets you engage in those conversations that if you don't have them in your school, then you have to go out and find those communities. And that, I mean, that energizes me, even if I don't have those conversations right directly in the school, I certainly have them here. And I'm confident to go back and say, I know Ellen, I know Sarah, 
I know people who really speak highly to what engages kids. And I'm going to have that confidence and that energy to go back to the classroom and, and make some of those decisions. Definitely. The one, one of the things that's helped us at, at our school recently is the idea of, and this just comes from our work with Matt Glover, the projection yeah. over the plan. Yeah. And just even that Superb shift in that word, process. right? Like, yeah. here's my lesson plan. Here's our plan for the year. You know, here's our unit plan. And then all of a sudden, we shifted to calling it just the progression and there's going to be some sequence lessons that we all picked out, but it's just a projection. Right. Yep. We're right. just projecting on how it might yeah. go. It might work. It might yep. work. And your writers may need three more days of the thing that Absolutely. my kids needed two of and right. however that works. And so I spent a lot of time like trying to fine tune when teachers are like, oh, what lesson should I be done with all these 18 lessons? By? And I was, it's just a projection. Yeah. 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 That Give actually was is one of the most brilliant pieces of work on curriculum that I have ever read, Matt yeah. and Mary Alice yes. uh, Barry's book. And I, I remember the line that I think is so relevant to your conversation here today from early in the book when Matt is quoting his little toddler, it went something would ha be found broken or something <laughs> had gone badly awry. And Matt would say, Harrison, how did this happen? And Harrison would say, I can't know. <laughs> yeah. And I, that, that, those three words, I can't know, is really everything that we're talking about, yeah, right? Because great. we can't know. Yeah. yeah. And nor can people who are, you know, who are providing this written curriculum, you know, that, that people are using with fidelity. I think you're both right about the essence um, and the sort of essential nature of having a learning community. And I think about places around this country where I've worked in rural areas, where people really do feel quite isolated and maybe yeah. literally the only person in their school who has read your work or has is trying to do things in a, in a student-centered way and is trying to watch and learn their students in order to know what's next, you know, the next mm -hmm. day, and maybe literally alone in those mm -hmm. circumstances. Um, Sarah, I, I remember you teaching me on the floor of the Heinemann booth one time <laughs> how to do something There's on no my computer, on my phone. about social media. Yeah, it was, no, I think you Twitter. were teaching me how to get on Twitter. So the, she kept here's, saying twit. I'm going to twit. No, I was gonna, no worse, it was worse. I was, yeah, no, that was right. You're right. I was going to twit. And, and Sarah said, no, no, Ellen. No, Maybe you're that's gonna, shorter you're than not. a tweet. But it, it does remind me of people in all generations, but particularly in yours, Sara, where the skill that people have now in connecting people who may be isolated, the skill that is there and the potential that's there to connect people for these mm -hmm. conversations and to help people find the courage of their convictions enough to go into the classroom and say, we as a community are not going to do this. The civil disobedience yeah. side of this, I think, is extremely powerful. And we've seen that happen through Twitter threads and through online conversations and online courses. I would love to hear more about your thoughts about civil disobedience in, and using that technology as a, a vehicle for doing that. Is Are we calling for civil disobedience in a small way? I right? think so. I'm a, I have a little bit of it in me, just... <laughs> Since I was a kid, I yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you can look at my first grade report cards to see where my civil disobedience <laughs> started. Marks, yes. Start, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I think education in many ways is civil disobedience. There's layers of civil disobedience in education. There's people that are s disobedient in that they have underground schools that they have because they know there's so much power in literacy and education mm -hmm. that they're hiding, or that when there was slaves that taught people how to read. And that was civil disobedience. Absolutely. They understand the power of that. Absolutely. And so you talk about good trouble. trouble. Representative Lewis talks about good trouble, right? Good trouble. And you mm -hmm. have to have some good trouble to make some moves. And the March series, the graphic novel series, March. Yep. Yep. I mean, that yep. is reading about kid, good trouble. Yeah, I, I think like you have to think it, it's divergent thinking in a lot of ways too. We want kids, we want teachers to be divergent in their thinking about how that we yeah. can take people places because we need to be today. Otherwise, we do follow the smoky says the cog, we're the cogs in the wheel, yeah. right, of the system. Right, and, and that actually 
is a beautiful segue into the next question, which is, I'd really love to hear your thoughts about something that I've been very interested in too, which is how children choose to engage themselves. Uh, I phrase that in a very particular way. Sorry, when you and Smokey wrote Upstanders, I mean, that, I remember thinking that at its core, this is really a book about engaging middle level learners. I mean, what does that, what does it take? And and can we think beyond the tasks that they have to do to the the, the inquiry that they can make into the world yeah. and just being so inspired by that. And Linda Quickwright is a phenomenon now. And it's, it's a way of saying to kids, you can engage instantly, immediately upon walking into the classroom in two to three minutes, but you choose. And I think that you choose, you choose. It really right. crosses all of your work. I hope it, it's, it's evident in mine. And it, it seems to me the pulse of engagement. But I, I'm curious, and, and I want to talk about this first in the spirit of our beloved Don Graves, who said, um, learning must always be for us first. I'm curious about what engages you each sort of outside of school or maybe in school. I don't know. But what are the, your, your, I, I call them engagement stories. And then somebody says, who's getting married? <laughs> like, well, I don't, don't know. Start spreading that I don't know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it, it's, it isn't that kind of engagement story. It's the stories of your engagement in the world and what for you makes you feel like you're all in. Time goes by and hearing. you're not even aware. Do you know yeah. that feeling of being all in? Because my hypothesis is that if we can describe that, we can describe it to kids and kids can understand and feel and, and get a, their heads around, their hearts around mm -hmm. what engagement feels like. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm totally disconnected from the classroom. I, had no books growing up. And so there was little reading or little writing in our house. Mm -hmm. Honestly, the Reader's Digest on the hamper was the most sophisticated reading that was available. And I thought that's where everybody read. Mm -hmm. But once I started writing at all, and I mean, the first time was with Don Graves. I took a course with him without knowing no, who he was. And it's a humble brag. Linda. Yes. At, yes. <laughs> well, so jealous. I, I mean, Incredible. I, I, had started in the classroom because we had been overseas for three years and we came home and built a house and I was doing a lot of the woodwork in the house and said to my husband, I have to go find something to do where I can see some other adults. And I got a job as an aide in our middle school and that was probably 40 years ago. Wow. But within two days, I was going into various classrooms because my major had been German and they had me go in to translate for a little girl who had come from Switzerland wow. because she only spoke French or German. And it was in going into those various classrooms that I went, this is unbelievably wonderful what is happening for these kids. This is awful what is happening for this group mm. of kids. This shouldn't be. Mm. And within a couple of days, I wanted to find out how do I become a teacher? Because you were seeing so many different examples I, I around the building. The, the stunning differences yeah, yeah, yeah. of kids going from one classroom to the next and the way they would be totally engaged in one and totally disengaged in another just startled me. It was unjust. It, well, it was un it I, absolutely, unjust. Absolutely. Yeah, which, of course, it is. And then the principal said, well, let's set you up. Let's get you certified. Let's get you a master's oh, wow. degree. And the first course I went into was with this gentleman the only seat available, he had all the chairs in a circle. The only seat available was right next to him. It happened to be Don Graves. I had no idea who he was. And we, he had us write. He just said, let's write. And we wrote. And then, of course, petrified as I was, he said, so turn and read your writing to your partner. And I'm thinking, I have to read this to the professor? Turned, read it to him. He laughed. He said, tell me more. And that honestly has been a mantra for me. Every time I kneel down next to a child, tell me more. He just made me, in that moment, feel like a writer. And that's the other thing I wanted to say, Ellen. It's, it's not just engagement. It's having somebody make you feel like you're heard, you're listened to, you're seen. Yeah. Yeah. And so I know now that something has happened that in the world that I live in, 
even outside of the classroom, it still is connected to the classroom. Where can I draw something? Where can I write something that means something to me that I can yeah. go back and show the kids that this yeah. notebook is so yeah. important to me? I would I would be crushed if I lost this notebook. It's so rich and full of fodder for oh, of just and, and meeting people like Sarah, who I had never yeah. met before, but reading her writing, reading your mosaic of thought. There's something in the world. I, I mean, I love going to my grandson's soccer games or to my granddaughter's performances, but there's something that's mm -hmm. always connected to that outside the classroom that still I'm always thinking, how can I make it better in the classroom yeah. for kids by living in that world, meeting people, seeing who they are, seeing what they're reading, what they're doing, what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. But you do that, and you take that, because the first time I was ever in Linda's classroom was in Booth Bay. It was two summers ago already? Yeah. Jeez. Um, and, well, this is actually a funny clip. Here I was, like, I had to talk first that night, which is, like, terrible planning. And <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm in the presence of, like, Linda Reef and Quick Rights, and so I'm going to, like, use the term quick right in my talk and I'm talk and I'm, I'm talking to the group and I'm like you are yeah, why, don't, why don't you just since we're in the presence of Linda Reef why does everyone do it just do a two minute quick right on whatever thing I just said and then you know I finish the talk and then Linda comes up next to talk and uh and, and you do it in the book too which I think is great I, I always think you're talking to me when you're correcting someone on what a quick right actually is she's like you know there are many ways people use the term quick right <laughs> This is, this is not the way that I would use it. You weren't talking directly to me. I know you weren't, but I was like, oh, I'm like mortified. You know, a quick write is actually a response to like a short piece of text. And it's like a first draft of something. And I was like, God, I've been hearing that word. I mean, you, here I am in front of Linda Reef saying this. Let's do a quick write, everybody. Oh, randomly that's... for two minutes. Um, oh so anyways, but the point of that whole quip is that um, Linda, in a room of pe whom people she did not know, said, let the lion lead you, and everyone yeah. was instilled with Linda's trust. Yeah. 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 Uh, off of did. nothing. Like, I, I, I hadn't met you. I only just, you know, found a girl from afar, and <laughs> your books are in our university and all of that, and just the things... That was what happened. Like, I, I wrote it down. I wrote it down everywhere that week. But it was just let the line lead you. Or you would say you choose. And that comes up a lot in, yeah, yeah. in the book. But sh you didn't care. You didn't give us any extra direction. You just said, here it is. And yeah. off you go. So and that's in the empowering. world of engagement, I mean, it is that choice, isn't it? Yeah. That, yeah. So, so much so. So I'm, I'm fascinated because I often answer the, this question the same way, Linda, that what where I find myself most completely consumed and engaged is when I'm working with children and, and teachers too. Yeah. But really when yeah. I'm doing demonstration work in the classroom, mm -hmm. I, I am all in a hundred percent fire alarms can go off. And I, I've often answered the question that way as well. And, and I'm also aware that what I speak to kids about is the, is sort of, engagement that happens for me outside of the classroom. I'm, yeah. I'm an aviation, uh, I'm obsessed with aviation. I, and I am still the person who likes to fly. I really am still the girl that sits at the window. And yeah. I am still the girl that reads all of, I get two aviation newsletters a week, just to, you know, in the interest of okay, full disclosure. You are. So I <laughs> am, no, I'm, I am uh, really, I, there's, I never get tired of that thing leaving yeah. the ground ever. Yeah. Just, I never get tired yeah. of that. So I will often bring into the classroom and kids are just like, well, that's strange. Looking, but you bring you, it in with you. That's but you, you bring it in and you bring yeah. in who I, you know, who I think we are outside, yeah. you know, of the, of the classroom. Sorry, you've traveled. I mean, speaking of, you know, fly girls, you've traveled. <laughs> You, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, you know, do you ever bring those stories of, of, you know, engagement? I remember last summer you were traveling and you were Facebook posting in from South America or Guatemala, in, yeah, Instagramming yeah, and, yeah. and yeah. I mean, that struck me as so, um, you know, such a deep engagement in yeah. another culture. And do you ever bring those stories into to kids? Um, I do, but I probably bring them in by way of what I've, what I've taken away 
or learned in the process of trying to immerse myself as fully as I can in the situation more than I think when I was younger and, you know, we had a great opportunity to travel, not often, but because we had family in India, we would try and go yeah. when we could afford it once, you know, every couple of years. I only went a couple of times. Um, but I, th- and, it, and then in my 20s, I tried to start traveling more to be more like my big sisters. And it wasn't ever like, I think when I was young, I made the mistake of saying like, oh, I went to this place and I got to go travel here. And here's the privilege of me going to this place. And I was like telling the kids about it. But like, I wonder really what it was that I was bringing back. So now it, it's a little bit different for me because I don't go thinking like, what am I going to bring back from this place? Right. I go in thinking like, how am I going to fully immerse myself in the exactly. place that I am yeah. in? And a lot of times, and people that know me know this about me, it's it's based around sports. Yeah. you know. And like wherever I am, if I'm in Guatemala and I just start playing soccer if someone lets me with the kids you know on the street or in the yeah. in the back of the schoolyard where yeah. we were walking yeah. um a lot of that I bring a lot of that in and I and I often say that coaching kids in sports is the best part of my day and that's not to take away from the classroom but that's because yeah. I see kids in a completely different way and that engagement watching their engagement in the field and I, me knowing myself as a kid athlete yeah, yeah. that brought so much more uh, wealth to my teaching. Yeah. Because I saw them in a different way. I knew I could coach them on the field in one way and bring that same coaching strategy into, into the classroom. This classroom. Yeah. 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 I, I think that, um, that just, I wish, <laughs> I wish I could just vid- audio tape. Oh, wait, we have. Um, and, and just like take what you've both just said back into your classrooms. Because I think kids are, are absolutely fascinated, not, Exactly as you said, sorry, not ex- about what you did or what, you know, in particular where you went or what class you took or whatever, but about the process of finding yourself immersed. Yeah. And I wonder, and I try to propose in engaging children that if they know the stories, not all, I mean, just, you know, here and there of others, not just teachers, but their own you know, moments when they were so fully engaged Mm -hmm. that that is contagious, that that's a virus in the best term, the best sense of the term. And that in this era, we always find ourselves saying in this era and all of that, all that that implies, isn't it helpful in a way perhaps that it hasn't been for for kids before to bring those stories in? Mm -hmm. Because engagement for kids outside of school may look very different than it did, Linda, when you and I first started teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, when there was play and there was, yeah. you know, talk around the dinner table and all of those kinds of things. You know, I'm not privileging that or, or saying that that was a better way, but I do think there's an increased call for discussion uh, in classrooms of what it is that um, happens, what are the conditions that we're in which we find ourselves in that state of total well, immersion? You know, there's, I was reading The Boys in the Boat, which I adore that book. I didn't think I would like it because I've, I've never really been a reader. So I'm kind of a slow reader. And that book is packed with information. But have you either one of you read that? Oh my gosh. No. It's just fabulous. But there's a, a portion of that book. There's just one little section about swing where the, it's the crew that won the Olympic gold medal yeah, yeah. in the 1930s on, oh, when they were in Germany, that. and it's phenomenal. But there's a section that they talk about getting into the boat, and there has to be this moment where swing means every single back is moving at the same time, every oar is dipping in at the exact same time. I mean, to me, that's what I think Nancy Atwell talks about in the reading zone. Yeah, in the You're so but, immersed in it. Yeah. And I think about all the years that I've been teaching, that doesn't happen often enough. I, I mean, there are times I can, I can remember the day that all of a sudden I looked up and I saw 27 kids so immersed in the reading, they didn't even hear the bell. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Nobody wow. moved. That's so what I was And yeah. that's the kind of thing that I'm always hoping will happen, right. but it doesn't happen that often. And so you, you have to just, I mean, you go in there every day hoping that you can get the kids into swing where all of you are so engaged. I love that swing. Here's the title of your next book, Linda. It was really, well, really. It's, I mean, that excerpt is just, I read that to the kids and I said, 
Where is it? Is it on the soccer field? Is it when you're playing the trumpet? Yes. Well, there is you it, are. You're it, having the conversation. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Where, where do you feel that swing that you know everybody around you is as engaged as you are and you are making things happen? Yeah. And I think that's what yeah. we don't get at in the classroom. I can't get at that with somebody else's curriculum. Right. It has to come from me absolutely. having a thorough understanding and feel and rapport that's the other thing. It's developing rapport with the kids. Yeah, yeah. But I think also what you're talking about, I'm talking way too much, is teachers reading and writing. Once we get yeah, into absolutely. that for ourselves, we have such a broader, deeper understanding of what it is we're hoping will happen for kids. And we're we're upping the, the likelihood that they will be right. in that engaged right. state. I was said that to a group of pre-service teachers the other day. I said, you have to be reading the books. Right. You have to know yourself as a reader. And even if you don't have time to read books, which you hear, right? I don't have time to read books. Like, think about what your reading life just looks like on the whole and how are you bringing that into kids. But, Linda, you wrote something in your book. Um, a person can read without writing but cannot write without reading. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I thought yeah. I had said that, that that was totally mine, but it actually goes back to Don Murray and Frank That's Smith right. and yeah. every other yeah. educator. Yeah. A- 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 absolutely. Well, yeah. sure. I just wanted to talk and learn a little bit. Right. Yeah, right. I just wanted to learn a little bit more about it from you, if you wouldn't mind just like speaking to No, I just think, I, I think we, I don't know, we were on this kick with reading be the be all, end all, and totally ignored writing for a couple yeah. of years over the last 10 years. We're still there in many schools. Uh, oh, in many, for sure. And I think when we get kids really right, you cannot write without reading what you've written. And you're constantly doing what a good reader does. Did the writer say what they really needed to say to make me believe this? Yeah. So when you're reading your own writing, you're going back into that writing and saying, have I made myself really clear? I mean, one of the things the kids, I, I'm noticing it even this year, the kids will say, oh, you a- just asked me a question. And I thought that was there because it was in my head. But apparently it's not there in the writing. I need to reread that and see what's missing. Mm-hmm. So y- you are reading critically Constantly. to see, have you told, have you said what you needed to say in the clearest, most succinct way that you can say it, or the most engaging way you can yeah. say it? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I mean by the, okay. by that. Yeah. And getting middle school kids there and getting them to that spot where that becomes like Which a Which is the next question. Right. Oh, is yeah. It? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, no. Do you hear interview, <laughs> Ellen? Nope. You, <laughs> you perfectly <laughs> to us. You've walked right into it, you know, from, from what engages you, you know, then I think we can really think about, especially for, in this context, middle school, but you're working with elementary kids now, so. Yeah. I mean, what are, and I wrote about this in Engaging Children, like, what are the conditions that I see present when we see kids engaged in the way that you describe them, Linda? And and I'm just curious what you see, particularly for middle-level learners, what are those conditions that really lead to the kind of deep engagement that we see sometimes but we don't want it to be a happy accident. We right, want yeah. it to be more of the norm. Nobody can be engaged to that level all the time. We're no, cognitively right. not no. capable of it. Right. But what do we do with middle level learners to increase the, and I think you've already spoken to some of it, increase the percentage of time perhaps that they're, that they're deeply engaged? It's a big question. Well, find, I, I mean, finding the books that they can relate to. Yeah, definitely. Um, finding the, not, not so much even just that they can relate to, but also seeing somebody else's world that they had no idea that this existed. Yeah. We're reading Refugee right now mm-hmm. as, yeah. as a whole class. And, and I'm constantly questioning myself, how long is this going to take us to read it as a whole class? Yeah. That it's worth the time. But I see the kids bringing up questions that are worth them considering, wow, this is this is happening still in Aleppo. Where is Aleppo? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they are asking questions that I know they they need to read about things that they would never read about. Also, it's not just finding themselves and seeing themselves; it's seeing the world also. Mm, mm-hmm. But also, I, I mean, it goes back to writing what matters to them. I mean, you've said this in Being the Change. If we don't write what matters to us, they're not going to write what matters no, to them. That's not at all, yeah. And I, I, sometimes I I think I, I used to pride myself on being with my eighth graders that they were, we were 
engaged because I was hoping that I was, it was coming from them in many ways. I had to, I often ask myself, like, what am I doing or about to do that's going to completely disengage them from the thing that they're doing? I, you, yeah. you know, you almost have to reverse. You yeah. do have to think about it. Right. You have to think, yeah. like, what are some things that I'm doing to... Well, and notice that yeah. moment, right? Yeah. When, yeah. Right. What did I just do to, like, completely disengage you from that thing? And how how does that look and feel when that happens, yeah. you know? So just watching that sometimes Such for a good me point. Yeah. Um, was important that sixth graders, you know, when we called it a soft start at Bishops at, yeah. at my school um, in I California... That was really only just about like the bell schedule, right? It's not a hard turn start. Off the bells. We turn off the bells. It's not a hard start. It's just a soft start. And so with the kids, you know, the deep engagement for them being sixth graders walking around, you know, in a departmentalized setting, brand new high school, but they're 11. It was the stress they carry, everything they carry with them trying to run across the campus. The book it was the safest. The magazine was the uh, safest, yes. right? And their engagement. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You just like, you could hear the hush and the weight off their shoulders yep. right? and that engagement. So listening to that, I mean, I, I'm totally guilty of this. I would try and do it for about, you know, five to eight minutes because I thought I had to start teaching or whatever mm -hmm. you, way you want to look at it. But if once you hear that, I'm like, what will I do to disrupt Don't this do, engagement? Yeah. Our thanks to authors Ellen Keen, Sar Ahmed, and Linda Reef. If you'd like to learn more about their work, you can follow them on Twitter. To learn more about the Turn and Talk series hosted by Ellen Keene, we invite you to visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening.